Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Baker Institute. Uh, my name is Neil Lane. I'm a fellow at the Baker Institute, and I work with my colleague, Dr. Kirsten Matthews, also a Baker fellow, who manages the Science and Technology Policy Program here at the Institute. We've had a number of lectures and panels and conferences on the subject of stem cells, since we believe there are a number of policy issues that are important, but also complicated, and need attention. Uh, I want to, many of you have attended our previous events. I want to thank you for that, and I want to thank all of you for being here for this afternoon's program. Today's topic was actually ripped from the headlines, and that's on purpose. When a science issue finds itself in the federal courtroom, it's important for all of us to try to find out what's going on. We're here today to discuss the recent court rulings regarding the National Institutes of Health guidelines on, federal gov on the federal government's funding of embryonic stem cell research. We would want to talk about the impact of those rulings and the future of the legal process. We're honored to have a legal expert with us and lawyer, Dr. Robert Riddle, uh, who will help give the legal perspective, as well as a research scientist, Dr. Richard Berenger, to share his views and I will introduce both of them in a moment. Before we turn to our speakers, let me give you a little background on the case known as Shirley versus Sibelius. And a good place to start the story is actually when I was in Washington. It's in 1996 when the uh, uh, Congress uh, attached to the appropriations, the funding bill for the, National for the Health and Human Services uh, Department and therefore the National Institutes of Health budget an amendment known as the Dickey Wicker Amendment, which is named after the two Republican representatives who wrote it. The Dickey Wicker Amendment was created to ban federal funding of all research on human embryos. It was created two years before the first human embryonic stem cell line was derived, so it was not intended to directly address this research. During the previous three administrations, Clinton, Bush, and Obama, the amendment has been interpreted as banning the use of federal funds to create human embryonic stem cell lines since an embryo is destroyed in the process. But the interpretation was that the federal funds could be used for embryonic stem cell research on lines created using private or state funds. The George W. Bush administration allowed some embryonic stem cell research to be funded, but in part, uh, responding to some conservative supporters, imposed a further restriction on federal funding, limiting research to cell lines that were created before August of 2001, regardless of which money, what money was used to create them. When President Obama came into the White House, he examined the policy and decided to remove the 2001 date, allowing federal funding for research on embryonic stem cell lines created at any time but tightly regulated, for example, with regard to matters such as informed consent of the donor. This change in policy in the Obama administration, simply <coughs> removing a date, may have appeared to be a small matter, but it made available many more stem cell lines to researchers. The Obama administration still would not allow federal funding for the creation of stem cell, uh, embryonic stem cells. As a result of the Obama change in policy, several pro-embryo adoption agencies and two scientists, James Shirley and Teresa Deischer, who work on adult stem cells, filed a suit to prevent the expansion of embryonic stem cell research. A district court ruled that the plaintiffs had no standing, but the ruling was overturned in an appeals court, which permitted Shirley and Deischer to proceed with their suit. On August 23rd, a U.S. District Judge Court, court Judge Royce Lambert granted a preliminary injunction halting all human embryonic stem cell research funded by the National Institutes of Health. This impacted over $140 million in federal research funds and approximately $6 million in grants to Texas. The injunction was stayed after arguments to the appeals court in late September so that research could continue, but the future is uncertain and I'm sure the legal issues are much more complex and nuanced than I have given you, and when Dr. Riddle will help us understand that. So we're going to hear from Dr. Robert Riddle, an associate with Baker Botts, 
who will discuss the case ruling on the future of Shirley versus Sibelius. Dr. Riddle received his PhD from the University of Houston in biochemistry and his JD from South Texas College of Law. He specializes in intellectual property law with an emphasis on chemistry and the life sciences, including nanotechnology, drug delivery, pharmaceuticals, bioengineering, and medical devices. We will then hear from Dr. Richard Berenger. Dr. Berenger is a professor of genetics at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center. He received his BA and MA in biology from California State University, Northridge, and his PhD in biology from the University of South Carolina. His research interests include mammalian embryogenesis, reproductive biology and disease, stem cell biology, and evolution and development. This afternoon, he will give us his perspective as a scientist in the field, and afterwards we'll have time for questions for the audience. And before I finish, I want to be sure that I acknowledge the state of Qatar and the Emir for uh, its support, his support of the Baker Institute's program on international stem cell policy. With this generous gift, we're able to bring to the Baker Institute distinguished scholars and professionals like the two gentlemen we will hear from today. Now please welcome Dr. Riddle. I'm honored to be here. Um, you might have noticed the first name in the law firm I work for, Baker Botts, is somewhat related to the Baker Institute. Um, but, but only just a oh, You may have to speak up, because okay. we're not picking it up. So uh, I'm here today to talk to you about the case a little bit, to try to give you a little bit of the uh, legal position of this case and the posture. It's a, it's a little convoluted because it's, it's not the typical legal case you're familiar with. Someone slips and falls and gets hurt and goes to court and is in front of a jury. This involves uh, regulations and implementation of regulations. And so different types of laws are an issue. It's not the kind of case that would go to a jury at all. It's the type of case that's a, a question of law. So it will be decided by a judge. Uh, basically, we're in the federal court in this case, and the federal court system has three main tiers. The first tier, or the trial courts, if you will, are the district courts. There's about 94 districts across the United States. One of those districts is uh, the United States District Court for the District of Columbia. Above the district court level is, are the courts of appeals, and those uh, group together various district courts and hear appeals from those district courts. So by hearing appeals, it means they never have juries in their courtroom. They never uh, make rulings of, of, in the first instance, they're always appeals of a lower court ruling. And the appeals court that is over the uh, district court for the District of Columbia is the U.S. Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit. So it's a little bit unique in that it's a smaller area. And of course, above the uh, Courts of Appeals is the Supreme Court. And uh, who knows, maybe this case will end up there at some point. Um, and I just wanted to give you here a little summary of how things have progressed. And, and the take home message here is, is twofold. This case is moving incredibly rapidly, faster than most cases um, would work through the legal system, and, and that probably has two components to it. One is in the court it's in is not um, overly busy as some other courts are. Um, two, both parties are incredibly motivated to see the resolution of this issue and have asked the, the courts uh, on numerous occasions to treat this in an expedited fashion, and the courts have accommodated that request. Um, and three, it's an it's a issue where both the plaintiff and defendants aren't sure what to do because of the, the questions here. And so resolution will help move things forward. And I think both the appeals court here and the lower court um, in DC are trying to respect that. Um, and on this slide on the top part is what the <coughs> appeals court has done so far. And the bottom row is what the district court has done. And so you can see that uh, the complaint was filed immediately dismissed. That was, of course, appealed. The appeals court remanded that case, which means they just sent it back down to the district court. And um, then the district court said, OK, I've got it back. Now I'm issuing the injunction. And they issued that injunction. 
the plaintiffs, the government, asked to put that injunction aside temporarily, just hold off on it. Um, district court denied that. <laughs> they asked the district court to, uh, they told the district court they were appealing, went back up to the appeals court. Appeals court said, yes, you can have the uh, injunction stay until we can decide uh, fully whether that preliminary injunction was proper. And I'll talk a little bit about as we go on what, it, what the difference between a inju permanent injunction and preliminary injunction what that is. Okay, so the District Court of D.C., uh, this case is before the chief judge in that district, Royce Lambert. Um, he was appointed in 87 by Ronald Reagan, and he's, he had the fortune to draw this case. And what did the district court decide initially? So when the, when the complaint was filed, one of the first things, one of the first legal analysis that happens is to ask the question, does this plaintiff with the complaint actually have a right to be before this court? So the Constitution says that in order to be before the court, you have to have some kind of harm or injury. And you can imagine in a case like that, uh, where someone is saying that there's a regulation and it's, it's implemented improperly and so I might not get my grant funded, that's the harm. And it seems a little bit of a tenuous, an inference upon an inference, and a little bit removed than the normal type of harm you feel. And, and actually, Judge Royce, that's what he decided. He said that uh, increased competition for funding is an insufficient injury to impart standing. Standing is the idea that you can be before that court. And therefore, he denied the preliminary injunction, and he dismissed the case. So that, of course, wasn't the end, because uh, when anybody loses and the issue is significant, they're going to appeal. And the case went to the appeals court, and the appeals court looked at the standing issue, the issue of whether you can be before the court. And the doctrine at issue here was called competitor standing, or the idea that because I'm a player in this market and I'm a competitor, a change in the regulation changes the dynamic between myself and my competitors, putting me at a disadvantage. The argument being that disadvantage is, a, is an economic harm that allows you to be before the court. And the appeals court said that there was no reason that competing for a government benefit should, should not be able to assert competitor standing when the government takes a step that benefits his rival and therefore injures him economically. So when I first was reading through the, the papers in this case, that struck me as odd because most of the cases that deal with competitor standing um, have to do more with uh, employment issues or regulated in industries like the energy industry where you can imagine a, a change in in regulations can impact you competitively for what you're sell selling. To me, that se seems far removed from the research endeavor in that there's no guarantee you're going to get a grant funded <coughs> no matter whether you're allowed to research embryonic stem cells or not. Um, there's no guarantee that um, if it's wide open, you'll get funding or not. So it, it's a little bit strange to me. And I'm not sure the case law completely supports that, but that's what the appeals court said. They weren't limiting competitor standing in any way uh, because of the research by Dr. Shirley and everybody else involved. I should note the district court did say that the other plaintiffs, besides the doctors, the adoption agency, the embryos themselves, the uh, folks that wanted to adopt the embryos, they did not have standing. So there was no injury direct from this regulation that they could point to that would cause them injury. And that the doctors and the plaintiffs in this case didn't contest that on appeal. So it was conceded. And so going forward, the only plaintiffs that are alleging injury thus far are the, the doctors that were competing for research funding. So once it made the decision that the plaintiffs, the doctors, had competitors standing, what did it do? It reversed the district court and told the district court to go back and deal with the motion for preliminary injunction. Now, a what a preliminary injunction means, it's, it's a, an initial matter before the case gets started. 
a party is asking the court, look, this is so important, we need you to hear it right now, and if it looks like we're going to win, then go ahead and, and stop the other party from going forward while the case progresses, because the case can be pending for quite some time. And that, by this appeals court judgment, it made the district court go back and look at that injunction issue and analyze it. And in a preliminary injunction, there's basically a four-part test. Um, is there a likelihood of success on the part of the plaintiffs? Um, is there harm? Does pu public policy uh, mandate an injunction? And so forth. So when it went back to the district court, how did the district court handle the issue of the injunction? District court went ahead and, and enjoined for the imp implementing the regulation and taking any action whatsoever. And this is often the problem with uh, court rulings. It's You ask yourself, well, what does that mean? Does that mean what's already started, that it's OK to go forward? Does everything have to be stopped? Do people have to give money back? What does it mean? It's unclear. Um, but that was the injunction, and that's the order. <coughs> that doesn't mean that the case is over. That just means that as the case moves forward, you can, NIH can't do anything else. So what did the plaintiffs do? Now they have their preliminary injunction. I mentioned before that this is a, a question of law. So once you've heard all the issues about whether an injunction is proper or not, because one of those factors is likelihood of success, you're basically ready to dispose of the case. And that's what Shirley and the other plaintiffs did. They immediately went and asked the court for summary judgment, which means there's no more disputed facts that we need to air. Based on the record that the court has before it, you can decide the issue. You don't even need to hear oral argument anymore, um, which is a hard thing for a lawyer to say, uh, but they did. Um, that motion for summary judgment is pending. What did the defendants or the government do in this case is they asked the district court to stay the preliminary injunction, basically saying, Okay, you issued the preliminary injunction, but there are, are other reasons why you should not impose that injunction on us. Let's stay that so we can move forward until the case is disposed of fully. Uh, the district court said no, did not stay the injunction. And so the district, the government then did what has been going on back and forth in this case. They went up to the next highest court and asked that court to stay the injunction. Now they didn't, uh, when they went to the appeals court, they, of course they asked to have expedited treatment. So the appeals court issued an injunction, initially a short one saying, uh, we're gonna stay the injunction so that the parties have a chance to brief the issues for the court. So they, they issued a, a stay, I believe it was September 9th. The parties briefed the issue. The appeals court heard the uh, motion on the stay and ultimately agreed with the government and stayed the preliminary injunction so that it could uh, hear it more fully. Okay, so the issue of preliminary injunction is not put to bed yet. So there's still an appeal court can rule and say the preliminary injunction is proper and it will still be uh, imposed. Or the appeals court might say it was improper and the injunction goes away and it's just like it is now with the stay. Um, but in parallel to this proceeding about the preliminary injunction, you have a parallel track of the case going forward. The same time you had the summary judgment motion asking the court to rule on the merits of the case, that briefing has gone forward in parallel. They're independent um, relief. What would happen after a preliminary injunction if the district court found in favor of the plaintiffs, they could issue a permanent injunction or an injunction going forward until it's uh, lifted for, in, for some reason. But the preliminary injunction only applies to the dependency of that case. <coughs> so what's, what's next in this case? I've sort of given you a, a quick summary, uh, but like I mentioned, the appeals court has to decide if the preliminary injunction is proper. That doesn't mean, whichever way they decide, they decide doesn't mean the case will go away. There will still be a case. Um, the, that preliminary injunction issue is also expedited. They've asked the parties to finish briefing by November 4th. And I would guess that uh, we would see a decision from the appeals court um, in December. 
And I would guess that the Supreme, the, the district court wouldn't rule on the summary judgment until they heard what the appeals court might say. If you're a district court judge, you might want to hear what the appeals court says about some of the issues in the case before you issue your ruling, because if, if the parties don't like it, they're going to appeal back to that court. Um, so it would make sense to me, and judges like to be efficient, so I wouldn't be surprised if that happened. So where does that put us going forward with respect to this case? Basically the same timeline, but what I've added is some of these issues at the end in yellow. Uh, maybe appeal decided in December, um, maybe in February the summary judgment will be decided, uh, you know, maybe earlier. That gives the judge time to take into account the appeal decision, read all the briefing in the case, and write an opinion. And then after that, depending on which way, uh, which way the cards stack up, um, I wouldn't be surprised to have uh, one of the parties or both appeal again. And that appeal would go back up to the Court of Appeals. And depending on how that went, eventually you might see it come back to the district court or even to the Supreme Court at some point. Or Congress might take action and make the whole issue move. Who knows? Um, what's sort of interesting about this is one of the complaints the plaintiffs had in this case was that the implementation of the rules violated the Administrative Protection Act, which is basically an act saying that courts have jurisdiction to make sure that agencies implement their rules fairly, um, that they give time for comment, that the, the implementation of rules uh, are not arbitrary, and one of the complaints they had was there just wasn't enough time for uh, proponents of uh, adult stem cells to vet the issues and to have themselves be heard in front of the NIH before the rules were implemented. Um, and so they've asked for the permanent injunction and they've asked for attorney's fees and costs as all plaintiffs do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So we, we asked Dr. Berenger to uh, make a few comments from a science perspective and uh, please please welcome him to the podium. Thank you. It's a great pleasure to be here. I thought I would give a few comments about um, a scientist's perspective sort of in the trenches, actually um, one of the uh, beneficiaries of the NIH funds to pursue Can you human, speak up, please? human embryonic stem cell research. So a few points. Um, one, I'm part of a NIH grant funded through the Baylor College of Money. Um, <laughs> Medicine. <laughs> Um, it involves uh, many uh, project investigators, both from Baylor and MD Anderson. Uh, there are four grants, primary uh, research grants on that uh, program, project grant. Uh, we have core facilities that culture the human embryonic stem cells, genetically manipulate them. If I add up the five years of funding, it's over $10 million. We're in the just starting the fourth year of this grant. It's a five-year grant. Each uh, project has about maybe four or five graduate student, postdoc, technicians. So it's, it's funding and training a, a large number of people here in the medical center, including my own lab. And when we applied for this grant, we were required to use the Bush approved embryonic stem cell lines. And for, I'd say, 95, 97% of the research we do, those cell lines are fine. We're happy to use them. So um, <coughs> we meet every month, the project investigators, to discuss different um, logistical issues for the grant and, and the science. And so we met in August. And I remember seeing on CNN this, uh, the first reports of this ruling, and I kind of just thought, well, that's interesting, and shrugged it off. It doesn't relate to me. Mm -hmm. And then as we started thinking about it, um, and then we had this meeting, all of a sudden it kind of, we were shocked to think that it, it really does involve <laughs> us. We're about to get our funding for the next year. Um, our funds come every September. And we were in this meeting really just shell-shocked with the idea that 
we might not get our money for the next year and we're going to have to lay off all these people and stop the research that we've been uh, doing on human embryonic stem cells. Fortunately, when we checked um, through our administration, we had already gotten what's called, a, a, I think, um, our award notice. So actually, the money was in the bank for the next year. So, you know, uh, so we're, we're OK for one year, but we're thinking to next September, will this issue get resolved? Will we be able to get our funding for the last year and, and keep our research going and keep our um, people employed? So that's sort of one thing that really hits us. Um, I'm also serving on uh, what's called a study section for NIH grants. What that means is when a grant application is put into the NIH, they're sort of bundled into different topics, and those sets of grants are reviewed by experts in that particular field. And I'm on a study section called Development One, and we get grants on human embryonic stem cells, and we just met last Thursday. We get the grant proposals about a month or two in advance so we can read them and make our judgments. And then we meet at, in one central place and, and give them scores. And depending on those scores, a fraction of those grants will be funded. Uh, right around the time of this uh, court judgment, all of a sudden we got an, uh, an email from our program officers saying uh, those two grants proposals on human embryonic stem cells don't look at them. We're, we're yanking them. So we're not going to review them. And then about two weeks later, because things changed so rapidly, they said, uh, we are going to review them. Mm -hmm. So we actually did review them last Thursday. Um, uh, another thing that um, sort of relates to what I've been doing, I'm part of an NIH-funded grant which gives money to um, underfunded states. and. Um, this grant is to support junior faculty who are on the tenure track to guide them to get their first NIH grant. And so I'm on this uh, grant as an advisor at the University of Hawaii in Honolulu. And one of the faculty that I mentor is doing human embryonic stem cell research. He went to Wisconsin and learned the methods, and he showed me some really interesting, intriguing results. And he's up for tenure, and he needs to get a grant from NIH. And he was emailing me saying, uh, well, maybe I shouldn't put in this grant using human embryonic stem cells because it'll just be killed. And maybe I should switch to these um, so-called induced pluripotent stem cells, which are pluripotent, but they're generated in a very different way. And I, I, I kind of advised him to keep on track Hopefully things will work out and you should really push the human embryonic stem cell research because that's where you generated your preliminary data. And then uh, sort of a final comment. It's very interesting that today the Nobel Prize was awarded to the people who, well, the person, um, who developed in vitro fertilization and the birth of the first IVF baby, Louise Brown. What's interesting is that, and kind of a, a little ironic is that the human embryonic stem cell lines that are generated are generated from sort of the uh, discarded or not used embryos generated from in vitro fertilization. Um, I hear when, when people describe how human embryonic stem cells are generated, they say that an embryo is destroyed. And as an embryologist who works with these stages of uh, embryos and uh, we derived mouse embryonic stem cell lines, I really dislike this word, destroy. What happens is you take the embryo and you disassemble it into single cells or clumps of cells. So you're not actually killing the cells. And then those cells will go on to make this cell line that can be cultured in the test tube, supposedly forever. And so when these first human embryonic stem cell lines were generated, a human embryo was disassembled into cells and those cells have been cultured in vitro and distributed around the world. So <coughs> millions and billions of cells now from an embryo that was only about 50 to 100 cells. I sort of see it from the embryologist's perspective as that the embryo was not destroyed, 
but actually the individual is immortalized, if you will. Uh, it's the, indi the, the cells of that embryo still exist in some form, and in a distant future, if certain technologies are allowed, you could actually turn one of those cells back into the individual who was supposed to be, um, if you were to um, have that embryo develop into an individual. So that's an embryologist's perspective. I know there's very different views, but uh, I really kind of wish people wouldn't use the word destroy when they talk about the generation of these stem cell lines. So those are a few comments from someone uh, actually uh, having a real consequent of, of, of this uh, ruling on embryonic stem cells. So thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Barringer. Um, I, I guess I'll ask the first question, but we're very if you're thinking of your questions, please. Usually we pass the mic around, but I'm not sure the audio is picking up from mics. So uh, just everybody uh, try to speak up with your questions. Uh, yeah, please, just got started off. All right, actually, I do in vitro fertilization. Uh, and I guess what I need, what I didn't really understand is clearly whenever our public affairs office at the American Society of Reproductive Medicine looked at this, they were looking at it more from the standpoint of the group who were trying to do embryo adoption. And so I really don't understand the other, you know, the nature of what you primarily presented because it seemed like to me if there were going to be more stem cells available, that would have reduced the competition rather than increased it. Could you do... Uh, could you expound on really more of what their argument was? I don't understand. Sure. sure. Uh, could, excuse me. Could everybody hear the question? Yeah. Okay. Thank uh, you. Could you just summarize briefly? Yeah, the, the question basically is, um, you know, my presentation focused on sort of the doctor plaintiffs and competition for uh, research dollars, and the other side of it is. The other plaintiffs that were found to not have standing were adoption agencies that specialize in adoption of embryos, um, and actually the embryos themselves, and a couple individuals who were interested in adopting embryos. Um, the embryos themselves, there was a, a, some court papers went back and forth about appointing a guardian, guardian ad litem or someone that would rep represent the interests of, of a person or entity that can't represent their own interests, in this case, the embryos. Uh, but for the adoption agencies, uh, the embryos, and the individuals, the court said that there was too distant a potential harm for them, for them to have standing to bring the suit. Um, so that is, if, if I'm in the business of uh, adopt. Uh, putting embryos out there for adoption, um, the ha how, how can I be harmed by the NIH regulations with respect to embryonic stem cell research? And, and their argument was along the lines that um, if you allow more research with embryonic stem cells, then mothers would be more inclined to donate their embryos to science and research than to have them stored and potentially donated to future parents of those embryos. Um, and, and that was their, what they alleged their harm to be. Um, the court said that was too far removed of a harm to, to have standing in the case. Uh, I don't know, did that answer your question? No, it didn't. Okay. Okay. I, didn't think I, it did. I understand that argument. What I don't understand is why there was, why, why there was gonna be, by not allowing more types of stem cells, how that was going to affect the competition oh, with grants. Because um, there's a, a limited pie of funding. And right now that pie is fully devoted to adult or induced pluripotent stem cells. And if you take that same pie and now you carve out part of it and say, for that same pie there's going to be a piece that goes to embryonic stem cells. So that means your pie is smaller if you're interested in adult stem cell research. Um, you're competing with other researchers for embryonic stem cells uh, dollars, funding dollars. But Dr. Riddle, though, I mean, if you get an NSF grant and I don't, can I go to court? I mean, what's kind of a precedent <laughs> could be right. set here? That's right. Um, you know, I was, I've been trying to think of how this could come up in a different context outside of this, and I think we're you know, somewhat in a unique situation because 
you have the uh, Dickey Wicker Amendment, and so the whole basis of the lawsuit was that NIH's guidelines violated the Dickey Wicker Amendment, um, and so therefore it's improper to have those guidelines. But then if you step back and ask the question in the, in the Bush era where he allowed the, how many, seven stem cell lines, whatever it was, um, why wasn't that improper in violation of the Dickey Wicker Amendment as well? And interestingly, in the oral arguments in the appeals court, when that same, when the justices posed that same question to the attorneys for the plaintiff, he said, well, I, I think it, it did, the Bush policies did violate the amendment too, but nobody had brought it at that point. Um, and, and it's, I think, I wouldn't say universally recognized, but from what I've read, uh, many commentators agree the Dickey Wicker Amendment is, is, is a little ambiguous. It's not a great piece of legislation. It's not the type of legislation you normally see in a bill that's passed. It's, it's a rider to a funding bill. So it's, it's sort of like uh, the kind of laws you hear about that slip through because they're attached to something else. Uh, but it's been around for a long time, and it's no surprise. Everybody knows about it. Dr. Barron, did you, did you have a comment on this <coughs> question? Well, I guess there was the, the legal one, but I agree with you that, um, well, first of all, I don't think there's so many um, embryos frozen from IVF clinics around this in this country and this world, and it's not limiting the number of embryos available. So um, using a few to make embryonic stem cell lines is probably a small fraction. Well, that's not exactly true either. No. Okay, I mean, <clears throat> I'm just saying, maybe around the world. In fact, actually, I will have a question to you about our limitation. I, I just came from, I was in May, I was in, in Bangkok. We were looking at an international stem cell meeting or whatever. But, and that's the second question. But the fact, <clears throat> I mean, I was, I was very glad, I'm actually glad to see people, that they talk about 100,000 frozen embryos. I'm glad to see them say that. They typically say 400,000 embryos, but that came out of a RAND Corporation study that I was a co-author of. Okay. And I will tell you that you know, we create, you know, we create embryos. I mean, we're not, we don't create them. We fertilize eggs. Okay. And if the ones we use some of them, if they're extras, we freeze them. But 90% of embryos that are fertilized that are not utilized and frozen are used by parents. They want, in other words, basically we're going to limit the number of embryos that are transferred initially to try to prevent higher order multiples, you know, quadruplets, and you know. And so that the vast majority of embryos are used by couples, and that's 90%, okay, to try to have babies, which that's just four. If you look at the 5% of embryos that are left, okay, about half of those are going to be destroyed. Couples cannot spare, cannot, cannot tolerate the idea that Junior may be walking down the street and they don't know it. So that leaves 2.5% of embryos, and of those, about half are, are donated for stem cell research and half are donated for adoption. And the people that are donating the embryos for stem cell, uh, uh, you know, are not going to be the same couples that are going to donate them for adoption. So the argument, which which well, didn't you know bear water anyway, was the fact that if they weren't using it for stem cell, this was going to increase the number of embryos for adoption, is not true. They would have probably just elected to thaw the embryos, have them, <clears throat> you know, they can't culture them for more than five or six days anyway. So there are not hundreds of thousands of embryos, and I sort of. I get tired of hearing it because it's not true. Because if, because if one of the it presumes that we're wasting embryos left and right, and that isn't true. We're, you know, embryo, uh, you know, excess embryos are utilized by couples 90% of the time. Sometimes when they, when they don't want to use them anymore, most of them, you thaw them, they grow to a certain stage and they stop. So it's a very small percentage of embryos that would actually be donated okay, you know, for either couples or research. If you crunch the numbers, what's the total number then that are available for stem cell? Well, <clears throat> I would tell you that in 19, you know, 2001 is when the Rand Corporation we and we we basically the study. But there were there were you know, it would be more like hundreds of embryos might be potential potentially available for use for stem cell development. Just hundreds. Hundreds. Okay. Now the other thing is this. Okay. Only one embryo. You know, it gets to the fact that if you're 30, 30 years old, only one egg out of three will make a baby. Mm -hmm. Two out of three are, are genetically abnormal. By the age of 35. Only one egg out of six will maybe make a baby by the age of 40, one egg out of 10. So the vast majority of embryos are already cybogenetically abnormal, and we haven't usually determined that. So you can utilize, for stem cell research, cytogenetically abnormal embryos, 
and certain, to a certain extent it can be useful, but they have limitations as well. <coughs> so that the percentage of embryos that may actually be cytogenetically normal is a fraction of even of those that may be donated you know, for research. So, so let's get comments on, on your, so thank you very much. Well, I, I disagree with it just being a hundred because um, we have received hundreds from a fertility clinic that they from were going to be clinic. a so single sick. clinic. So there might not be, <laughs> maybe there's no knowledge and it varies from clinic to clinic a lot. But um, yeah, we've received hundreds. Now, how many clinics are there in the world? There's one. There are yeah. 400, 400 in the U.S. Hundreds of cells or hundreds of embryos? Hmm? Hundreds of cell lines or hundreds of uh, Hundreds of embry em embryos were made available to us that were going to be discarded. Mm -hmm. Oh, wait a minute. Okay, well, I indicated, I said that's true. The vast majority of embryos are going to be discarded. We're talking about <laughs> the numbers of, em I guess I'm talking about the number of embryos that will be available for adoption. As a, as a small percentage of the total. Okay, so I mean, your point is it's far less than 400,000. Your point is it's far more than a few. Well, I have no idea. I, yeah, I can yeah, just sure. say how many that one clinic has made available. To okay, but it's an important sure. point, and I think the point's been made. Comment, please. Future technology. Um, I was just at a meeting where, uh, so, I'm not a clinician, but um, my sister in law went through this. So, you, they get uh, injected with hormones and ovulate, and it's a surgical retrieval, and the number varies depending on the individual. Um, what people have been working on is to take um, pieces of the uh, ovary and then culture them in, in vitro to a mature oocyte. And for many years, you know, they could only progress here and there, and they keep changing conditions. But at this uh, recent meeting uh, I organized um, this summer, uh, a group from the Karolinska uh, Hospital in Sweden had found one factor that seemed to be really good, and big antral follicles. And so now they're checking on um, some of the molecular genetic aspects of that, and I think they're potentially a step away from uh, clinical trials. So th the idea is that if you take a little piece of the ovary, there's many, many immature oocytes there, and if you could in, in vitro mature them, now instead of having one, two, ten, you could have many. And now if those all get fertilized, you could have many, many. So <laughs> th things are constantly changing. That's true. Any other, other questions? Please. How is this dealt with in Europe? <laughs> <laughs> Six words. That's easy. Do they have the same struggle? Because I think what people are not talking about is why in America we have such a struggle about this issue. And I just was curious, are the other Western countries or even the Eastern countries, any countries, struggling with this like we are? Uh, yes and no, well, actually. Yeah. Uh, yeah. There are some countries like the UK who has a policy that's set, and then they know what they're doing. They're very permissive, but they have a regulatory structure you have to go through. And then you move over to other countries. Germany is very similar to what Bush had. They have a date in the line saying this is it. <laughs> some countries have banned it. Some countries haven't. It's kind of a, a mix of different ones. Most of them have a little bit more permissive. Uh, they look more similar to what Obama is doing without having the date using leftover IVF eggs, is the, I would say. The majority is in that direction. In the ones that are permissive, and you compare them with the ones that are less permissive, what's the factor that makes the difference? Is it a historical thing? Is it a cultural thing? Is it a religious thing? What's blocking the ones that are not permissive, and what's allowing the ones at all? Oh, we have a comment back I here. I would like to comment. I was present in the first uh, summit that we had from the Baker. Uh, about, I think it was about two years ago. And this is one question that was posed. And uh, uh, I think uh, from the UK, there was a representative that was uh, the equivalent of uh, the NIH president. Yeah, Lord, and, uh, Lord Patel yeah. was here, and he was chair of the, am I right, Kirsten, mm -hmm. the committee that, in fact, decides on licensing of so, uh, uh, research. The explanation that she gave was that in, in the UK, 
that because they had the first test tube baby and the policies were widely discussed in the society, right. when the stem cell, embryonic stem cell <coughs> came, were, uh, people were educated. Basically, she said, people were prepared to discuss that issue. People were educated. <coughs> And uh, I think that's the difference, you know, that you have a country that had dealt with very serious issues like uh, IVF, and then they can deal better with embryonic stem cells. The U UK experience really is, a, some of us feel, is a model for us to look at because of the, the deliberative process and the involvement, I would say the courage even, of the scientists to get uh, out with the public and the policymakers in Parliament to make sure that at least the facts were understood. And I think in the end, the argument was a moral imperative. I think it was, in the end, people were convinced that on balance, uh, there was a moral imperative to support this kind of research because it could, in fact, uh, heal. So what's the block in Germany? I'm sorry? What's the block in Germany? In Germany? Um, uh, I think mentally it's more of a link with eugenics. They've already had a history. They just don't want to proceed. So um, there's uh, some countries in that region we were discussing. We were trying to decide where uh, some of the countries were in that region in because of that. So. Dr. Brinkley. Uh, many of us think the only solution is to get rid of uh, the micro amendment. Uh, how would be, uh, if you were advising how to go about getting that uh, dispensed with in legislature, what would be your recommendations? I think it'd be a challenge because it's it's been there. And I, I think it goes to back to a policy issue. If you, if you, if you talk about IVF, usually we're not talking about creating embryos for purposes of research. We're, creating embryos for purposes of letting people have babies that otherwise couldn't. And what's left over is going to research. I think most people would agree that the idea of creating embryo embryos pr purely for research may be a little bit dangerous morally. Um, and so this is sort of the, the middle ground. And it's not dissimilar to where a cancer patient donates their cells for research, and those cells are immortal in some cases. Um, and so I think there's some parallel there, but I, I think the U.S., uh, the, the religious aspect, the cultural history of the U.S., anything that has to do with reproductive health or, or anything of that nature is very contentious, and that's where the fight is. And many people have said we should get rid of the Dickey Wicker Amendment and, and put a piece of legislation in place that is more thought out um, and, and applied to this area of research more. I mean, originally, I think Neil mentioned the Dickey Wicker amend Amendment didn't have anything to do with stem cells. Um, so it, it sort of morphed into that over time. Uh, I don't know that there would be an easy way to get rid of it. <coughs> it really it seems, uh, I mean, I'm really sad to hear you say that because I hope that the legal uh, support we have out there will look at ways to get rid of it because I think that's the only way we're going to solve this problem because it's so broad. And, uh, you know, I wish that we had a strategy that would uh, define more precisely what, I liked your definition, they're just cells and they're no longer human bodies. We have to educate the public. But the public already supports embryonic stem cell research. I'm on the Board of Research in America, and we did a study across the nation, and over 60% of the people, a uh, thousand that were in it, said that they, they're in favor of this. So this is clearly against the majority. The, there might be a resolution to it in the case itself. One, one of the issues uh, or questions that parties dispute is, what is research? And I sort of alluded to this when I said people create embryos for purposes of having babies. Well. That's not really research. The amendment is directed to preventing um, creation or destruction or whatever of embryos for purposes of research. And so there's sort of distinct things happening here. And research is taking this over here, you know, the embryos, and going forward with it, just like scientists do in other areas of health and medicine. 
And so it could be that the case falls out that the definition of research is, is defined in some way that makes the Dickey Wicker uh, less prohibitive to embryonic stem cell research. I agree with you, Bill. I think we need a strategy. And it's dangerous in our Congress because this amendment is not the only federal it's, it's, law that uh, is not well put together. I mean, there are lots of examples. And, and uh, I remember during the time we were talking about this, in, uh, in the time I was in the White House, there were bills on the Hill. They didn't go anywhere, but some of them would have prevented all forms of human reproduction. <laughs> <laughs> would not have been popular. <laughs> and I think would never have become law. I mean, most bills don't, but I think we need a strategy. Please, and then I'll go back. I, I have two things. First of all, two words in reply, and it's a difficult reply to what can be done to get rid of Dick, uh, the Dickey Wicker Amendment. And that's Castle de Get, which twice passed through Congress right. and was vetoed. That would have taken care of, or should have taken care of, Dickey Wicker. You may have another opinion of that. I don't know the law. The second is I'd like to ask the gentleman two seats in front of me. Uh, actually, how many, uh, in your experience, how many, uh, realistically, how many of the excess embryos are disposed of in a given year? Okay, well, <clears throat> well first I seem to be unable to multiply 2% by 400,000, so I apologize <laughs> for that. But, but <clears throat> I think that... Uh, that's a difficult question, only because a lot of the embryos probably, it is probably less medical legally risky to keep them in liquid nitrogen than to destroy them. Okay, then the thought, but that is clearly being done. A colleague of mine has just been sued because she didn't get the email <coughs> that the couple said they would begin to you know, pay for them. I, <coughs> so they had thawed them, and then a couple weeks later they said, we're ready to have the embryos back. And so I think that so so that, so probably that kind of you know that data is hard to get. Uh, it was 2001, the last time there was the was that. But people are thawing embryos and discarding, and so and that clearly is the more likely choice they have when they when they determine what they want to use them for. But often many people are hesitant to actually thaw them, and so they you know so but they but people are cleaning out their cleaning out their supplies. No, the, the so usually it's five. Usually you're given about five years to use them. But there are different kinds of criteria. One is the other criteria is that you should try to stop them by the time biologically reproduction would normally stop. That's usually age 50. So I don't know which clinic you're getting your embryos well, from. Well, there, there, there it's, it's not one in Texas, but um, I, I must say too these these the ones that we've got were over a period from 1996. I mean we've only got them in the last seven years, but I mean, some of them were, you know, fertilized in 1996, and then it was later when they no longer wanted, and then they wanted them to use, use them for research, and they've been sending them to us, and, and, you know, I mean, I would have a problem with this myself, except they were going to be discarded. discarded. So I look at it, if they're going to be discarded, why can't I use them to save human lives, or potentially? And so that, that's my uh, attitude of it. But, you know, as a scientist, of course, I'm not going to, say, go out and, you know, fertilize eggs so that we could use them. I'm just wanting the ones that are being discarded. Now, I'm always thinking maybe the fertility clinics in this country need to be more regulated. I mean, you see these octomoms going around. <laughs> so it certainly maybe uh, in, in certain states or, in, you know, there's no regulate. You know, they, they can just do whatever the client is willing to pay for. But certainly, I, I'm not going out and recruiting people to do this. It's just that these people contact us and say, the clients or their patients no longer want these. They want them right. to devote them to research. Do you want them? And I say, yeah, by all means. Okay, well, first off, I have a three-hour reply to the fact that we're regulated or not regulated in this country. 
I mean, I'm just, I mean, which is, I mean, first, and clearly, passing a law against robbing banks has certainly prevented all bank robbery. Okay. You know, and so I will even tell you that I'd be happy to, to tell you that the HFAA or whatever in England, they're debating closing it. I mean, I got an email today from the bioethics. It's a great bioethics symposium. And so, because basic, you know, because you know, the idea that Europe has, that England knows how to do it, is not exactly true either. Uh, from the standpoint of the different, uh, for the different trusts, they're not even funded. Okay, so they tell people they have IVF, but I'm sorry, there's no funding for it. If you have a kid, you can't do it. If you're over 35, you can't submit. So, so I will tell you that, you know, that even the the English in evaluating the systems of regulations in this country have decided perhaps they don't even need the HFDA, and that's a that's a that's an important debate. So the other thing I asked for is we write the American Society of Reproductive Medicine. We have a pamphlet. We held we held a uh, we held a uh, symposium last November, in which we <coughs> we had uh, we had NIH, CDC, we had you know <coughs> we had uh, different groups, and we've looked to talk about there's there's like nine nine different ways that we are regulated. So by the way, the Octodoc, we've just we kicked him out of our society. We're providing testimony. We're providing testimony. He's being evaluated by the California State Medical Society. So, I'm just saying clearly, the you know the odd the oddballs are you know, will claim a lot of our will claim a lot of our attention. And so, uh, just as just as a fact, is there are people that are doing scientific malfeasance in, in universities? I think the UK issue that I wanted to emphasize is they have a deliberative process. Right. We do not have that. We generally do not have it on many important items of legislation. It's not the way we operate in our form of government. So, but it regulates. So, it's also different in this country how we regulate medicine. Medicine is the state. Medicine is regulated at the state level rather than the federal level. But we can talk. We, I, you know, we can. We, you know, Let me ask the panel if they have yeah. comments on on this particular issue. I want to take two more questions. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the only the only thing I would comment on the idea that these embryos would be thrown away. There is a a long line of cases starting with garbage. If you put garbage in front of your house, you don't want it anymore, and someone can come go dig through your garbage, and you have, don't have any right to that anymore. And there's a similar line of cases based off of those early garbage cases that if you have medical waste, then, uh, uh, like, for example, these cancer cell lines that are used in research, that, uh, that the hospitals can take those and do research on them. Now, the twist has been with the medical issues is the informed consent. And, and so maybe it's an issue with the embryos of informed consent, as long as the uh, uh, donors understand what it means to donate an embryo to research, as they and they consent to it, then it's okay. I mean, maybe that's the reasoning that should take place. We we'll take a question back here, and then I'll take this Thank last you. one. Um, this is probably going to be like a little. Um, I was interested in understanding the, um, these adult stem cell researchers who are um, have this complaint that there will be additional competition. I was wondering how their argument exactly worked. There's been a policy change which has opened up more stem cell lines for the betterment, betterment of the entire society, and a small minority of the society is saying this, you know, harms me. Um, but do they have to prove that this does not, you know, have some additional greater benefit for all of society in order to win their case? No, I mean, really, all they have to prove is that the guidelines. I mean, there's two issues. One is is what's what's legally their complaint and and the issue of what, how they're harmed allows them to bring that legal action. So the way they're harmed is saying that I'm going to be subject to more competition and potentially economically suffer. That's their harm. So now they can uh, bring their legal argument. Their legal argument is that uh, basically under the Dickey-Wicker Amendment and under the way the, the laws that dictate how administrative agencies implement rules that those laws weren't followed. So if you want to change a regulation, you have to put it in the public register. There has to be a certain amount of time for public comment. And, and part of their argument is that this was just pushed through so quickly there wasn't public comment. All these comments were ignored. So the implementation of the regulation violates the Administrative Protection Act. So the standing doesn't have to be connected to their legal argument at all? No. Well, just as long as they're injured somehow by virtue of violation of that. And so with the new implementation, there's it's harder for them to get a grant is their argument. So there is a connection. 
Right. Uh, I'm an attorney by training, but I've taught political science at Rice for you a while ago, so Thank let me for speak for that. politics. <laughs> it is much, much harder to pass a bill to, uh, than to defeat one. Uh, it's hard to get things changed. This is the Baker Institute. Did Jim Baker ever go head on into an issue? No, Soto Voce, subtle, work around it, go through the administrative procedure route. To think that any of you smart scientists should spend even one minute of your valuable, useful time when you could be doing good science, trying to mess around with a statute that you have almost no chance of doing anything about. It's fine to have a, a say over a glass of wine, but it doesn't make any sense for any of you smart folks to put your time into that. Well, some of us are perhaps more optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> maybe old enough, maybe old enough, so that so that's not a way. A comment on that comment? <laughs> yes. <laughs> there is a group called Texans for Advancement of Medical Research. You're, right here are three of the founders. We have been in business since 2003. Believe me, Dealing with the Texas legislature, we know it's easier to prevent something than it is to get something worthwhile done. Mm -hmm. We have been very successful in preventing, but we are doing the work that you're saying the scientists shouldn't waste their time on. And we're agreeing it's hard to change the status quo. No, I agree. And when you don't, when you want to stop something from happening, it's much easier. No, I, I agree. Let me just interject one thing to Joe's comment. We could not have possibly stopped so the bad legislation in this state from passing had we not had the scientific community behind us and it actually in front of us going and talking to the legislators so they can understand what embryonic stem cell research is and isn't and make an informed, educated decision about what they could what they could uh, vote for. Okay, I think that means, thank you very much for your comment and thank you for your comment. I'll add have one more question of Dr. Riddle and that's whether the advice that Dr. Berenger gave to his young colleague in Hawaii is good advice. What is going to happen? <laughs> That's a million dollar question. Who knows what's going to happen? Um, yeah. what is you know, you have a Republican district court judge, you have a, a mix on the appeals court, and it's a, a politically charged issue, and, and who knows what the outcome is going to be. Any, any final comments from either of our speakers? So we, we have embryonic stem cells. We have. Um, so-called induced pluripotent stem cells, which are related, but they're, they're not coming from embryos. And um, I was talking to a friend in Toronto who generates induced pluripotent stem cells, and what he's finding is that the reprogramming process where you take a somatic cell and add some molecules and they become pluripotent stem cells is very hard on the genetics of that cell, and, and they're actually detecting genetic damage in those cells. So, I have scientific friends that just a couple weeks ago just say IPS cells and everything, we don't have to study human embryonic stem cells, and I'm saying, well, maybe we shouldn't put all of our effort into induced pluripotent stem cells. Certainly they're very, very interesting types of cells, and, and there's the hope of personalized cellular therapy. But if we do that to the exclusion of our ESL research, it may come back to haunt us. And I'm actually thinking that maybe cloned embryonic stem cells might be the way towards personalized cellular therapies. And when IPS cells were first reported, so many of the scientists, even the uh, Ian Wilmot, who uh, generated Dolly, the first cloned animal, said, well, we don't have to worry about cloning anymore. But I'm actually thinking maybe we do. And, and so really from a scientific perspective, it's not the legal. We really have to have a balanced scientific portfolio not just pursuing one type of research. Thank you, everyone, for your attendance, for the spirit of discussion, and let's thank our panel.